Hello and welcome back to the TMDSAS podcast. This is Enrique with the TMDSAS office in Austin, Texas. Before we get started with our discussion with Dr. Barbara Miller from the Texas A&M College of Dentistry, we wanted to share some information with you about the Texas MedDent Roundup coming up this October. It's a two-day event on October 6th and 7th. October 6th, is for high school seniors, college freshmen, uh, any high school counselors, advisors, or parents that would like to learn more about the Joint Admission Medical Program. And on Saturday, October 7th, and on Saturday, October 7th, the Texas Med Dent Roundup is open to college students, non-traditional applicants, and undergraduate advisors. If you're interested in joining us for this free event, we will be in San Marcos, Texas. That's about halfway between Austin and San Antonio. And you can actually register by going to our website, tmdsas.com. We have an ad on there. And also in the description of this podcast episode, there's a link that takes you directly to our registration page for the MedDent Roundup. We hope to see you there. We're closing off our non-traditional applicant series with Dr. Scott Wright. If you're a member of the non-traditional applicants Facebook group, you can actually submit your questions for Dr. Wright to answer during his podcast episode. So make sure you join the group by following the link in the description of this episode. Our discussion with Dr. Barbara Miller today takes us to a dental school's look at when considering non-traditional applicants. There are different types of considerations for applicants when they're applying to dental school. One of the key differences is that dental schools require that applicants be enrolled in school uh, a little bit longer than medical school applicants if you're non-traditional. And now moving on to our discussion with Dr. Barbara Miller. Welcome back to the TMDSAS podcast. Today, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Barbara Miller with the Texas A&M College of Dentistry back with us. Dr. Miller, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Enrique. Yeah, it's great to talk with you. Well, thank you. We've got a really great topic uh, as part of our non-traditional applicant series, uh, and we're very, very happy to have you on board for... uh, where you can actually give us the perspective for the dental schools and how we can help our non-traditional applicants to uh, schools of dentistry throughout the state. Yes, yeah. And, of course, I'm going to focus on the dental uh, aspect. And uh, so, But I'd like to start off with some positives before I get to the challenges because I have a few challenges. So, um, you know, really I'm so happy that we're talking about non-traditional applicants because this particular group we found has had a lot of uh, success in our dental program. And um, the faculty members have found the non-traditional students in general to have high maturity level and strong work ethic. You know, maybe they have work experience or um, uh, served in the military and they've developed their communication skills. And, you know, all of these are really great characteristics uh, and life experiences that help them get through the dental curriculum, which uh, everybody knows, I think, is very rigorous. And, yeah, and these non-traditional students can also add um, maturity and leadership to their entire class. So there are a lot of positives. Definitely. So could you tell us a little bit about what might be different for a non-traditional student once they actually get into dental school? Yes, uh, some of the challenges that I've noticed for non-traditional students have uh, a lot to do with time management, and it's uh, usually because they um, have like extracurricular responsibilities. You know, they might have family or financial responsibilities that a traditional student uh, would not have uh, to worry about, um, and we don't recommend. Um, students working in dental school. So, um, you know, that would mean um, organizing their life uh, a little bit uh, differently. And uh, and those that have children need to have backup plans for child care in case the child gets sick. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, just being very uh, well organized um, to be able to balance that schoolwork and all of the things that they have to do in dental school with their family responsibilities. Um, Then another challenge uh, is for people, you know, who may have been in a leadership position prior to dental school. And, of course, leadership is a great characteristic to have. Um, Yeah, and but some people might find it difficult 
after being the leader, to take direction from other people. And what I'm thinking about is from the faculty. So um, they want to make sure that they're still teachable and open to learning new ways to do things, even if they've worked in a dental office for years. And uh, then another challenge is getting back into a habit of studying. And that kind of leads into... um, Wanted I, what I wanted to make sure that you all know about what we're looking for in non-traditional dental applicants. Yeah, let's go ahead and just jump right into that. Okay. Um, well, first of all, for non-traditional applicants, they need to have the same kind of activities that we look for in the traditional applicants. So what I'm uh, thinking about there is shadowing general dentists. And uh, especially for those non-traditional applicants who are making a career change. And we found that um, sometimes, uh, like maybe someone said, oh, my brother-in-law's a dentist and he's making good money and he likes his job. I'll try that. And um, But they really need to do shadowing similar to a traditional student to make sure that this is really what they want to do. Because, yeah, we've had um, non-traditional students um, start the program, and as soon as the going gets rough, and it does get rough, uh, they drop out because they can fall back on their previous um, career, whatever they were doing before. And um, so I think that the faculty and the admissions committee is really hesitant to... um, have someone take a spot and then drop out because there's no way to replace them at that point. And the community has then lost that dentist, uh, that position really forever. Uh, So, um, you know, even more so than traditional students or just as much as traditional students, they need to shadow general dentists. And then uh, community service activities are also important. Uh, and, and very important uh, academics, including current coursework. And that's that's something that's um, a little bit of a, a shift from medical applicants is that um, medical schools don't necessarily have a requirement that somebody be enrolled at the time they're applying. Mm-hmm. Uh, but dentistry, um, you all do have that requirement. Right, yes. And uh, and it's not just any kind of um, current coursework, but um, particularly the courses that help prepare them for the dental curriculum. And I'm talking about anatomy, physiology, microbiology, immunology, histology, biochem 2. So these biomedical science courses that are foundational for the, for the dental curriculum. And I think that's because we're expecting them to um, just jump right in and be able to apply this foundational knowledge to uh, real-life clinical situations. So it's good to, you know, be have a good foundation. Yeah, so, and not only that, the, the coursework will help them have good study skills. They can develop good learning strategies. Um, when they have that foundational knowledge, uh, that usually uh, helps them to free up some of their study time, and then they'll have more time for uh, family responsibilities or study time uh, for the more challenging clinical curriculum. So it helps them be really well prepared. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and mm-hmm. and for you know non traditional applicants who may have you know, graduated a year or two ago or have been out of school for a while, Mm -hmm. what kind of opportunities exist that allow non-traditional applicants to show that they're prepared for the rigors of dental school? Yeah, uh, yeah, there's several different options that uh, people have uh, done and and been successful at at all of these uh, different uh, options. And uh, I have to say, first of all, um, we get a lot of calls uh, from applicants, and uh, some of them are non-traditional applicants, and they don't want to do further coursework. They say, no, I've got my degree. Um, and they even argue with uh, my assistant and I. Uh, but to be really well prepared and competitive in the admissions process, this is really necessary. So no gap year. 
Uh, so a good way to fill that gap is to do um, either, uh, and this is not just for non-traditional applicants, also for re-applicants uh, in general. Um, they could enroll in a post-baccalaureate program or a one-year master's degree program. Um, and these are usually specific for pre-dental or pre-med students. And, um, or they could take several post-bac biology courses, um, you know, those courses that I mentioned earlier, if a program's not available to them. Yeah. We've actually been talking with a few advisors across the state about the same topic. Uh -huh. uh, and, you know, they, they gave us a little glimpse into what a post-bac program looks like or what a master's degree program looks like. Right. Um, but really, I think it when when we're talking about um, figuring out which type of school a student should attend, that's when an advisor becomes really paramount in the process uh, because they'll be able to walk with walk through the whole scenario with an applicant and figure out what's needed in order for them to reach their goals. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the other thing is, um, you know, not all programs are alike. Uh, not all programs are really rigorous, so that they should really look into the programs and, like you said, you know, talk to advisors and gather information. Uh, I think a program that has at least 30 semester hours of instruction over two semesters and the kind of topic areas that I mentioned before would be good, and a variety of courses. You know, for example, um, not like all neuroscience or all microbiology. Right. And then, nice variety. Yeah, variety of those um, biomedical courses that are foundational. And uh, then they need to perform at a high academic le level. And we would be looking for like a 3.5 or better GPA. You know, make, taking a, a course like this and making all Bs is not going to be helpful to them. So this is a chance um, for them to show the admissions committee that they, that they can perform well um, in this kind of um, curriculum. And especially if their early GPA and their first degree was not as high, as they would like for it to be. And so they can really prove with evidence that they're more highly motivated as a student now and ready for professional school. And the admissions um, committees actually from TMDSAS receive uh, different types of GPA. So we, we don't just have undergraduate or graduate GPA or over, overall or BCPM. You know, we have uh, overall GPA, we have overall... Um, BCPM overall non-science, and we have overall science GPAs that are calculated. And then we have those same four calculated for an undergraduate career and the same four calculated for a graduate career. And so these actually give uh, admissions committees a glimpse into where that upward trend is coming from. So as you just mentioned, if somebody didn't have such a stellar uh, academic career as an undergraduate, but as a graduate student, they've really knocked it out of the park, uh, you you as an admissions committee member can actually see that upward trend, and that paints a really positive f picture of who that applicant is. Yeah, absolutely, and we love that. We we really like that the TMDSES uh, breaks that out for us, and we look at that for every applicant, and it is so very helpful. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about what a non-traditional applicant can do to be more notable uh, in the application process? Yeah, um, well, really, it's the, that part is the same for a traditional student, uh, and that is like uh, following uh, what we're looking for. Uh, I guess you would be surprised that even though we publish all of the criteria that we're looking for, uh, not all the applicants um, do everything that we're looking for. So... Um, and um, I think I mentioned before that, you know, then they argue why they don't have to do it. And uh, so being someone, and this is going to show, too, that they're still teachable and open to learning and following directions. So um, I think uh, especially for non-traditional, they've had uh, life experiences. So make sure to highlight on the application 
um, their uh, people experiences, the people skills, how they've developed those, um, which will translate into doctor-patient kind of interactions and uh, working with the public. Uh, a lot of times our non-traditional students uh, have uh, a lot of, um, um, like I said, working with the public kind of experience. So uh, sometimes uh, if they have slightly less in the community service area, if they've had a lot of people interaction in their job, um, that'll kind of make up for that. And um, uh, But, you know, for, for all of the... Um, things that we look for, shadowing, community service, I know it's more of a challenge for non-traditional students to get those hours because most of them are working and have families and a lot of things going on. So um, actually doing those things, the community service and the shadowing, shows the admissions committee that they're willing to make some sacrifices to... Um, achieve their goals and that's really important too absolutely yeah mm -hmm. do you have any final advice for our non-traditional applicants out there uh yes you know it's like um don't worry about being older <laughs> um every year we have um several students who are in their 30s who start dental school. Uh, we've even had some in early 40s start dental school. And, uh, you know, if you really have the desire to be a dentist, don't let uh, that stop you. Um, and we've even had uh, non-traditional students go on to specialize, which, uh, you know, is extra years, and they were already a little bit older to start with. But, um there are plenty of opportunities, and I think the main thing is to find out, do your homework and find out what the dental schools are looking for so that you don't waste any more time and you don't spin your wheels, kind of. You know, you want to make sure you're very efficient with the time that you have uh, in uh, taking specific courses that are good uh, rather than just random courses and uh, activities. You can kind of um, look for activities that fit more than one category, like a volunteer experience that also is in the dental office um, or in some kind of uh, healthcare kind of uh, volunteer work. So that fits, um, you know, two of the things that we'd like to see, you know, learning about dentistry and also volunteer work, and uh, so like uh, Texas Mission of Mercy uh, events, those happen uh, several times a year across the state. Those are great uh, volunteer op opportunities where you get a chance to see um, like mission dental work in action, and uh, yeah, so, um, you know, there are quite a few of those events, so I highly recommend those. Uh, seek and ye shall find. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Miller, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast and sharing all of this wonderful advice to our non-traditional applicants. Yeah, my pleasure. I enjoyed it. If you found this podcast to be beneficial, please make sure you hit like. And if you could please leave us a review to help us improve the podcast and make sure that we can continue to reach a wider audience, we would really appreciate it. You can always reach TMDSAS on our social media pages, facebook.com slash TMDSAS. And also on Twitter, we have two handles, at TMDSAS and at TMDSAS support. And once again, on behalf of everybody here at TMDSAS, we want to wish everybody all the best of luck in their application this cycle. Thank you very much for listening. We'll talk to you later.